L'argent devait aller directement aux travailleurs canadiens de l'acier et l'aluminium. Mais nous savons maintenant que seulement 11 000 ont été donnés. D'autres victimes de l'été des chèques de premier ministre. On ne pouvait pas se fier sur les belles paroles du premier ministre qui disait qu'il allait être là pour les travailleurs. Pourquoi le premier ministre ne remettait-il pas l'argent directement dans les poches des travailleurs? Monsieur le Président, comme j'ai dit euh, euh, au, tout au courant de l'année, nous allons être là pour appuyer nos travailleurs dans l'industrie d'acier, d'aluminium, dans nos travailleurs dans toutes les industries à travers le pays. Euh, nous avons mis de l'avant des mesures pour les aider en cas de besoin, mais nous continuons aussi de s'assurer euh, en travaillant pour diversifier notre économie, pour, en so pour uh, travailler, pour appuyer l'innovation uh, chez nos travailleurs d'aluminium et d'acier, uh, que nous continuons de défendre ces industries contre les actions irresponsables et punitives des États-Unis. Monsieur le Président, la récente décision sur Trans Mountain indique que les libéraux, je cite, ont échoué à dialoguer de manière significative. En d'autres termes, le Premier ministre a promis d'améliorer les choses puis a brisé ses promesses dès qu'il a pu. Ça devrait sembler très familier à tous les Canadiens. Après trois années de fausses promesses et un bilan d'échecs, pourquoi devrions-nous faire confiance à ce Premier ministre pour qu'un pipeline soit construit? Monsieur le Président, parlons plutôt des dix années d'échecs du gouvernement Harper qui refusait d'accepter que de protéger l'environnement allait main dans la main avec la création de croissance économique. En plus, ils ont continué de marginaliser les communautés autochtones et depuis trois ans, ils nous critiquent parce qu'on en fait trop sur l'environnement, parce qu'on en fait trop pour la réconciliation avec les peuples autochtones. Au contraire, Monsieur le Président, ce que la Cour vient de dire, c'est que nous devons en faire encore plus et c'est exactement ce que nous allons faire. Nous savons que de protéger l'environnement et... Order. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister seems to be the only person that thinks that things are going well in Canada's energy sector. <laughs> The judge ruled very clearly this Prime Minister failed to do proper consultation. And where he failed, Conservatives succeeded. Four major pipeline projects built. The Kinder Morgan Anchor Loop. And on the Kinder Morgan Anchor Loop, Mr. Speaker, this increased the ability of Canadian producers and marketers to access growing markets on the West Coast as well as Asian markets. That's from a Kinder Morgan statement because that pipeline opened up. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, they were unable to get our resources to new markets. And the reason they were unable, despite everything they tried, is they thought the way to get things built to new markets was by eliminating environmental oversight, or obstacles as they'd say, and continuing to marginalize Indigenous peoples. We know that growing the economy goes hand in hand with protecting the environment and with reconciliation. That's exactly what we're doing to grow our economy and protect Canadians for the future. It is this Prime Minister who has destroyed real economic opportunity for First Nations people when he cancelled Northern Gateway and ripped that opportunity away from so many Northern Indigenous communities. It is this Prime Minister that has made Canada more dependent on foreign energy by killing Energy East. So we have to continue importing oil from places like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. But it was the Conservative government that got pipelines built, that got our energy to foreign markets. Why does this Prime Minister have it in for Canada's energy sector? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
If anyone in this place or anyone across this country needed proof that the Conservatives don't know what they're talking about when it comes to Indigenous peoples, citing the end of the Northern Gateway Pipeline as something that went against Indigenous peoples proves that they are hopelessly out of touch with the concerns of Indigenous peoples. Yes, there are voices in the Indigenous communities on all sides of the debate. But the fact that that Conservative government did not respect Indigenous voices is why they couldn't get things built. Only Tuesday. Order, order, order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's summer failure has also included his carbon tax coalition falling apart in tatters. But even before Rachel Notley pulled out and abandoned the carbon tax plan, this Prime Minister abandoned his own plan. He announced that he would give big businesses and big emitters with big government relations experts a special deal. They would be exempted to up to almost 90 per cent of their emissions. Meanwhile, individual hardworking families will have to bear the entire brunt. When will the Prime Minister finally do the right thing, join the millions of Canadians who are clamouring? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we understand how important it is to fight climate change while building a strong economy for the future and good jobs for Canadians over the coming generations. That means we agree that putting a price on pollution, making sure that polluters pay, is the best way to move forward. Now, the Conservatives do not have a plan to fight climate change, won't tell us what they plan to do. We just know they're offering the same 10 years of Stephen Harper of doing nothing on the environment. Mr. President, in October 2015, the Premier Minister denounced the fact that the Partenariat Trans-Pacific was negotiated in secret. In October 2015, the Premier Minister declared that he would never touch it. À la gestion de l'offre, qu'il n'y aurait aucune concession. Les producteurs laitiers de ma région et du Canada dépendent de la gestion de l'offre et me disent à quel point c'est essentiel pour la survie des fermes familiales. Le Premier ministre peut-il nous dire ce qui a changé en 2015 et aujourd'hui et peut-il s'engager à protéger intégralement la gestion de l'offre? Le très honorable Premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, comme je dis depuis non seulement des années, mais presque une décennie, euh, le gouvernement libéral, mon parti euh, libéral, va toujours défendre la gestion de l'offre. Euh, nous sommes à tout, tous d'accord sur ce côté euh, de la Chambre. Euh, ce n'est pas le cas pour tous les partis, mais nous savons à quel point c'est un système qui fonctionne, c'est un système qui protège et nos agriculteurs et nos consommateurs, et nous allons continuer de défendre la gestion de l'offre et les producteurs laitiers. Il y a deux semaines, je me suis rendu à saint mathieu de rioux sur la ferme familiale de Charles, qui produit du lait depuis 31 ans. Il travaille tout le temps, sans relâche, si bien qu'il évalue son salaire horaire à 5,50 Charles me confiait que les brèches qui ont été faites par les conservateurs et par les libéraux à travers le traité commercial avec l'Europe et le partenariat transpacifique ont fragilisé sa situation financière et celle de sa famille. Est-ce que le premier ministre, qui avait promis de ne pas toucher à la gestion de l'offre en 2015, peut finalement respecter sa promesse plutôt que de continuer à entretenir le flou? Monsieur le Président, nous allons continuer de défendre la gestion de l'offre. C'est un système qui fonctionne pour les producteurs laitiers. C'est un système qui fonctionne pour les consommateurs canadiens. On a pu signer des accords à l'international tout en protégeant notre système. On va continuer de défendre un système qui fonctionne pour les Canadiens, qui fonctionne pour nos agriculteurs. On October 4, 2015, the Prime Minister said on television that the TPP should never be negotiated in secret. And now, he's signing on to a deal that he negotiated in secret. The Prime Minister also told Canadians that he'd never compromise on supply management. And now his government is doing exactly that and trading it away. Mr. Speaker, farmers are scared they're going to lose their family farms. When will this Prime Minister start keeping his pre-election promises and stop using these farmers livelihoods as a bargaining chip. 
of the uh, right Honourable Prime Minister. Many times, Mr. Speaker, in this House and out of it, we will continue to defend supply management. But I think uh, with the CPTPP uh, moving forward through the House this week, I'm happy to highlight the fact that, indeed, the deal as it was signed by the Conservative government was not good enough for Canadians. That's why uh, we continue to negotiate. We made uh, significant positioning uh, in Da Nang and with our partners so that we would get to an improved deal that included things like a cultural exemption that the Conservatives, for example, were willing to give away in TPP. We know how to stand up for Canadians, and we always will. The Honourable Member for Essex. I'm not sure the Prime Minister understands what they've signed on to. The Trans-Pacific Partnership will be a blow to Windsor-Essex, and people in my region are begging the Liberals to hold off on pushing through this job-killing trade deal. I met with small business owners over the summer who warned they are being slammed by steel tariffs and may be forced to shut down. Yesterday, I called on the Liberals to delay the CPTPP so Canadians can brace for a possible failed NAFTA and more U.S. tariffs. Instead, they are steamrolling the deal through Parliament without proper debate. Why are the Liberals hell-bent on killing Canadian manufacturing jobs? Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we find ourselves in a very familiar situation in this House. The NDP don't want any deals uh, for Canadians, don't want to sign any trade deals. The Conservatives are willing to sign anything they can. We know that only signing good deals for Canadians is in our best interest. As with CPTPP, when it comes to NAFTA, we will sign a good deal or we will not sign. Honorable député de Richmond, Abasca. Oui, Monsieur le Président, dans moins d'un mois, le Premier ministre va légaliser la marijuana partout au Canada, au grand plaisir de ses amis du secteur. Pendant ce temps-là, les corps policiers partout au pays affirment qu'ils ne seront pas suffisamment formés, qu'ils seront mal outillés, qu'ils ne seront tout simplement pas prêts. Le Premier ministre n'a pas écouté les municipalités, les experts, les médecins et surtout les services de police. Comment peut-il justifier cet autre échec qu'il fait payer aux familles canadiennes? Mr. Speaker, I, I want to assure this House that you know, I've met regularly with the law enforcement leadership of this country, and unlike the previous government, we actually listened to what they asked of us. They asked, for example, for the opportunity to give a ticket to a young person rather than criminalize them for simple possession of marijuana. Mr. Speaker, we listened. They didn't. They asked for the technology and, and the training needed to keep our roadways safe dealing with impaired driving. We gave them what they asked for. And, Mr. Speaker, I've met with law enforcement across this country. They're working diligently. They'll be ready to keep our community safe. En plus des échecs du gouvernement dans les négociations de l'ALENA, on s'enligne directement dans un autre conflit majeur avec notre allié américain dans le dossier de la légalisation de la marijuana. L'avocat Jean-Pierre Rancourt, qui pratique aux États-Unis, affirme que des Canadiens pourraient se voir refuser l'entrée sur le sol américain. Est-ce que le Premier ministre peut garantir à tous les Canadiens qui vont consommer de la marijuana une fois que ça va être légal, qu'ils pourront entrer aux États-Unis ou ça sera encore un autre échec qu'il aura sur la conscience? Speaker, I simply remind this House that since 2013, we have had a well-regulated medical marijuana industry which employs tens of thousands of Canadians and which Canadians have invested hundreds of millions of dollars, and yet it's had no impact on their ability to cross the border. We have entered into discussions with our counterparts in the United States to ensure that Canadians are treated fairly and according to the rule of law when they cross into the United States. L'honorable député de Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. Monsieur le Président, hier le ministre nous a informé qu'aussitôt arrivé en poste, il a fait une demande pour rencontrer son homologue américain pour entamer des discussions sur l'accord des pays tiers sûrs. Mais les Américains ont déjà confirmé qu'il y avait eu des discussions. Fait que là, on dirait que le Premier ministre n'a pas pu informer son ministre encore. Ils n'ont pas eu le temps de se parler. Entre-temps, les migrants légaux se moquent de nos lois, les provinces doivent payer la facture et les Canadiens se font traiter de racistes. S'ils osent critiquer le Premier ministre. L'été de l'échec libéral continue, M. le Président. Nous avons un plan, ils n'ont pas de plan. Quand vont-ils régler l'accord des pays tiers sûrs? Honorable Minister of Border Security. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, let, let me be very clear. As I indicated yesterday, Canada has a long and proud tradition of providing protection to those who are most in need of, of protection by providing refuge, refuge to the world's most vulnerable people. The Immigration and Refugee Protection Act requires the ongoing review of all designated safe third country to ensure the conditions that led to their designation continue to be met. As per my mandate, I have already sent a letter to Secretary Nielsen asking to enter into discussions related to irregular border migration of our shared border, including ways in which we can enhance and improve the existing safe third country. Comme je le disais, M. le Président, on voit que l'été de l'échec libéral continue. Le ministre vient d'arriver en poste, mais on a appris qu'il y avait déjà des discussions qui avaient été entamées pour changer l'accord des pays de tiers sûrs. Puis là, on nous dit encore une fois qu'on n'est pas correct avec les gens qui arrivent ici légalement, mais eux sont en train d'essayer de négocier ce qu'on propose depuis le début. Donc, on a des ministres qui vont à Washington pour rire du gouvernement en place. On a un premier ministre qui négocie une entente économique avec des arguments culturels. À quel moment on va régler l'entente des pays de tiers sûrs, M. le Président? Monsieur le Président, contrairement aux conservateurs de M. Harper, nous prenons les décisions fondées sur les preuves et les données de juillet 2008, 2018 montrent que le nombre d'interceptions à la frontière était la moitié du nombre de l'année passée. Les conservateurs de M. Harper, M. le Président, continuent de politiser l'enjeu en créant de la peur pour recommander éventuellement la militarisation de la frontière. Ils devront arrêter cette désinformation-là. Nous allons respecter les engagements internationaux et la sécurité des Canadiens en même temps. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. We didn't have an illegal border crossing crisis under Prime Minister Harper, Mr. Speaker. For any other Canadian telling their boss that they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a problem that got worse would mean that they would get fired. So when this Prime Minister stands here and tells Canadians that he spent hundreds of millions of their tax dollars on illegal border crossers, but their numbers continue to grow, it's clear by this failure that he needs to go. How many illegal border crossers are currently being hotels, housed in hotels? at taxpayer expense. Now the Minister of Immigration. I'll educate the Honourable Member on the disastrous record Order. of immigration. Parents and grandparents had uh, a backlog of 167,000. We've reduced that to 25,000. Spouses had to wait 26 months to reunite. We've reduced that from 75,000 to 15,000. And living caregivers who provide an invaluable service to Canadians had to wait five to seven years under that party. We've reduced their backlog from 62,000 to 11,000. They had a disastrous record, and Canadians know that. Order. Frequently in this House, members will hear things they disagree with or that they're dissatisfied with. But they should expect that, I'm sure, by, this, by now, and members should be able to contain themselves and not react until it's their turn, which they get eventually. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Let's talk about education, Mr. Speaker. It has been under this government that Canadians have lost social license for immigration because of that minister's failure to close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement. It has been this Prime Minister and this minister that is putting ahead people who have reached upstate New York instead of reuniting Yazidi genocide victims, Mr. Speaker. It's been this government who over and over again have prioritized people who are not legitimate refugees over the world's most vulnerable. When will this government close the loophole in the safe third country. Order. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Yazidi refugees. They brought a grand total of three Yazidis to Canada. We brought 1,400 Yazidi survivors of Daesh to Canada, Mr. Speaker, and we're encouraging private sponsors to bring even more. Let's talk about private sponsored refugees that meet the generosity of Canadians. When it came time to meet and, and fulfill the generosity of Canadians, they only had 4,500. Order. Order. 
order. I didn't hear anyone yelling when the member for Calvert Nose Hill was asking a question. I would ask her not to do so either. I think all members know better than that. So I'd ask the Honourable Minister of Immigration to finish his answer. In order to meet the generosity of Canadians, we have increased the private sponsored refugee program spaces to 18,000, Mr. Speaker. That is our record, Mr. Speaker. They couldn't do it. We are getting it done. Honorable député de Rosemont, la petite patrie. Monsieur le Président, je vais vous dire comment réagissent les gens de Rosemont, la petite patrie, à l'achat du pipeline Trans Mountain. Richard Côté m'a écrit l'achat de Trans Mountain apparaît de plus en plus comme le pire gaspillage de fonds publics de l'histoire du Canada. Monsieur Fillon s'est demandé imaginez deux secondes, si le gouvernement avait investi cet argent dans des projets prometteurs pour l'environnement et les énergies du futur, nous aurions pu devenir des leaders mondiaux. C'est exactement ça qu'ils auraient dû faire. Quand Quand est-ce que les libéraux vont prendre au sérieux les changements climatiques et les jobs de demain? Nous savons que c'est très important d'avoir accès aux marchés internationaux. Ça, c'est important. C'est pour ça que nous avons considéré la, la situation avec le Trans Mountain Pipeline et l'extension du Trans Mountain Pipeline. Nous allons maintenant considérer les, euh, les faits avec le, la décision de la Cour fédérale pour assurer que nous pouvons avoir un euh, engagement important avec les peuples autochtones et pour assurer que nous considérons les situations environnementales. Ça va être un autre plan. C'est une approche importante. Nous allons continuer avec notre approche. Leur processus était tout croche, puis la Cour fédérale les a remis à leur place. C'est ça qui est arrivé. Mais il n'y a pas juste sur l'île de Montréal où les gens sont inquiets. À salaberry sur roi où passe le pipeline de Enbridge 9B, les gens ont des grandes préoccupations aussi. Les correctifs nécessaires sont ignorés. Les valves de sécurité ne sont pas aux normes. Et l'Office national de l'énergie protège la compagnie pétrolière et refuse même de répondre aux demandes d'information de la MRC. Imaginez si Énergie S revenait maintenant. Est-ce que les libéraux sont au service de la population ou des compagnies pétrolières? On peut avoir une bonne réponse quand on voit la ministre de l'Environnement faire des barbecues avec un tablier de Enbridge. Monsieur le Président, nous parlons au sujet des marchés internationaux. Ça, c'est très important. C'est pour ça que nous avons considéré la situation avec Trans Mountain. Nous savons que c'est important de considérer les, les considérations des peuples autochtones. Nous allons engager dans une façon importante. Bien sûr, c'est très important de considérer aussi les, la situation environnementale. Nous allons considérer la situation. C'est important d'avoir une approche, un plan. Nous avons un plan pour améliorer la situation. Situation and continue with the for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister described his failure on the Trans Mountain expansion as, quote, almost a really good thing. Only liberal logic would say it's a good thing that their failure cost thousands of workers their jobs. 2,000 families lost good paying jobs and now are stressed about their uncertain futures. This is not almost a really good thing. It's been three weeks. A really good thing? would be to tell these families what the plan is here, to here. get their jobs here, back. Here. So where is the plan for the Trans Mountain expansion? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the decision to ignore the impact of the marine traffic on the environment was done by the Harper government. The decision to ignore the protection of endangered species was made under the Harper government. The court has acknowledged that we put a framework together that was acceptable. We need to engage with Indigenous peoples in a way that is meaningful, that is two-way dialogue, that allows us to find mitigation where it's possible to do so. That is exactly the plan we are putting forward. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Whenever he fails, he just blames others. But former Toronto Liberal MP and two-time Liberal leadership candidate Martha Hall Finley, she agrees the Liberals are failing. She said Bill C-69 is, quote, deeply flawed. And now is not the time to pass legislation that could make our investment climate here, even here. worse. The Liberals killed three private sector pipelines. Their failure stalled Trans Mountain. 100,000 energy workers lost their jobs and hundreds of thousands more at risk. Billions I of investment is saying. leaving Canada. Will the Prime Minister scrap his no-new pipeline bill, C-69, 
before he completely obliterates the Canadian energy sector. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, if Harper Conservatives were, were in power today, there would be no TMX because they are against the purchase that we made in workers, in getting up resources to the global markets, and making sure that jobs are created for Albertans and for British Columbians. We are going to move forward on this project in the right way, respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples to be meaningfully consulted, at the same time protecting the environment. That is the path forward that we are developing, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government's Trans Mountain failure has real consequences for Indigenous peoples. Chief Ernie Cray of GEM First Nations had this to say, what we negotiated will be lasting training and lasting jobs. Our young people every day come to me and say they want to get trained, they want a job, and they want to say goodbye to welfare. To Thank us, you. it means millions of dollars to my band alone. More casualties from the Prime Minister's summer of failure. When will they present a plan to get Trans Mountain yeah, built? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, one thing that is absolutely clear from this ruling is that in order to build large energy infrastructure projects, you cannot ignore your constitutional obligations to properly consult with Indigenous peoples. And you also cannot ignore your obligations to protect the environment. We are putting forward, we will be coming back with a plan that would allow us to protect the environment, respect Indigenous peoples' rights to be included at the same time, grow our economy and create middle class jobs. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, a strong Alberta energy sector creates jobs right across Canada. For example, when the Prime Minister killed Energy East, 300 jobs were lost at a GE plant in Peterborough. Shit. After a summer of failure, this government's bungling of Trans Mountain jeopardizes many more Ontario manufacturing jobs. This government is failing Canadians as investment flees Canada. This government is failing Canadians as families lose the means to keep food on their table. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister finally present a plan to Canadians to get Trans Mountain built? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, let me share some numbers. 3,600 jobs created by Amazon, 295 new jobs created by Burlope Technologies, 675 new jobs created by Stem Cell Technologies, 300 new jobs created by Bell Helicopter, Mr. Speaker, 1,250 jobs created by Sanofi, 4,000 jobs created by Encore, 2,200 jobs created by Nova Chemicals in Alberta. That's getting the job done, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. When the Prime Minister came to Nanaimo, the air was choked with smoke. He heard climate change worsens wildfires. He heard coastal people warn increased oil tanker spill risk. Some called it a national disaster. He didn't listen. Just a week later, the Liberals bought the pipeline just as the courts were shutting its expansion down. When will this government finally listen to coastal communities, shelve the climate change hypocrisy, and cancel the Kinder Morgan expansion? Bravo. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, our government has an ambitious plan to protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time. Our emissions are dropping and Canadians have created over half a million jobs in the past few years. Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward with putting a price on pollution, investing in the green economy, and if the NDP can't get on board with growing our economy while we put forward aggressive measures to protect our environment, then they're going to find themselves in opposition for a very long time. Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Order. Last week, Canadians were devastated when Scarlett, a three and a half year old orca, was declared dead. Coastal communities and people right across the country continue to voice their concerns on the effect of increased tanker traffic on our coast, but the Liberals aren't listening. Instead of acting to protect this endangered species now, 
the Liberals are in court defending their inaction and continue to push for the expansion of Trans Mountain. Canadians don't want to see another orca die. Will this minister issue an emergency order now and protect these whales? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, ensuring the protection of Canada's oceans and the sustainability of marine life are key priorities for our government. Our government is committed to the protection of Canada's resident killer whales and the recovery of these populations. Our government is working in population, in, in partnership with Indigenous peoples, key stakeholders, international partners, and the province of British Columbia on immediate actions to reduce the impact of marine shipping and assist in the recovery of the southern resident killer whales. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, comme euh, facteur des pays, les étudiants de ma région de Saint-Guillaume, Preston Chesicoke, sont retournés à l'école depuis quelques semaines. C'est avec fierté que les parents ont choisi que leurs enfants soient éduqués en français, soit devant le programme d'immersion ou soit avec le programme langue première, le conseil scolaire acadien provincial. Et la raison pour laquelle ils choisissent, c'est qu'ils veulent que leurs enfants soient bilingues. Ils veulent que leurs enfants puissent parler deux langues du pays. Ils sont fiers de notre histoire et ils voient les opportunités. Donc, demandez à la ministre des langues officielles de démontrer comment le plan d'action va aider à ces programmes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, M. le Président. Nous avons eu l'occasion de développer un excellent plan d'action sur les langues officielles. En effet, nous avons investi 2,7 milliards en langues officielles, le plus grand investissement en langues officielles de notre histoire. Et nous savons que nous voulons justement préserver et promouvoir les droits des communautés linguistiques en situation minoritaire. Et ça passe par le fait qu'on investisse dans nos enfants, en petite enfance et aussi en éducation pour s'assurer de maintenir la pénérité de nos euh, communautés en langue officielle. Merci. Mr. Speaker, last week, the Liberal summer of failure included a stop in Saskatchewan. One failure top of mind for Saskatchewanians is the Liberals' carbon tax grab. The Liberals are continuing their attack on hardworking families and struggling seniors with their unaffordable carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister stop punishing Saskatchewan by imposing a federal carbon tax and recognize the authority of the province? Mr. Speaker, the environment is a priority for this government, and we will not apologize for putting a price on pollution. The fact is, the cost of inaction is too great to ignore. By 2020, Canadians are going to be bearing almost $5 billion as a result of extreme weather events such as forest fires and floods. Mr. Speaker, we need to move forward with a plan to protect the economy and grow the economy and protect the environment at the same time. Under the Harper Conservatives, they failed to put a plan on action. They still have no plan today, and I am shocked, and I'm sure you'll join me in dis my disappointment if their plan is to make pollution free. Monsieur le Président, l'été des échecs se poursuit pour le gouvernement libéral contre les Canadiens. Hier, en entrevue à McLean, le premier ministre a été très clair et il a dit que peu importe ce qui se passe, il va imposer la taxe libérale sur le carbone. Il va l'imposer aux provinces malgré que les provinces, les unes derrière les autres, refusent. Il va l'imposer aux familles canadiennes et pire, en cachant l'information aux familles canadiennes. Est-ce que le premier ministre pourrait pour une fois donner l'heure juste aux Canadiens? Il il a le document en main. Est-ce qu'il pourrait dire quel va être le prix pour les familles canadiennes de la taxe libérale sur le carbone? It is our preference to work with the provinces and territories, but when provinces will not take the responsibility of protecting them to the environment, then we will put forward a plan that ensures every Canadian is taking part in a framework that puts a price on pollution. Mr. Speaker, if there is anything that's being hidden here, it is the Conservatives' plan. I'd invite all the Canadians that uh, would like to see what their plan is to check out the Conservative leader's platform he ran on during their convention if he hadn't deleted it from his website after he had won. Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. We will grow the economy. We will protect the environment at the same time. It's what Canadians expect. It's what they deserve. And it's what we will deliver to them. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, in fact, this government does believe that pollution should be absolutely free if you've got a powerful lobbyist. One of the 
fine print details in their carbon tax plan is that large corporate industrial polluters will not have to pay it on 80 to 90 percent of their emissions, even though single moms and seniors will pay it on 100 percent of their home heating and gas bills that they pay just for the luxury of going to work in the morning, Mr. Speaker. Why is it that this party of privilege Whenever it proposes new taxes, it always exempts its wealthy friends. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, it seems the Conservatives have no plan for the environment. The NDP have no plan for the economy. We are moving forward with a plan that's going to grow the economy and protect the environment at the same time. We are putting measures that puts a price on pollution so it is not free for emitters, but we're also recognizing that certain trade-exposed industries need to remain competitive in the global marketplace. Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward with a plan that will make life more affordable for Canadians and more expensive for polluters. Order. I remind the Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning that we each get our turn here eventually and one waits till they have their turn before speaking. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, this has been a summer of tax fairness failure for this particular government. Not only, we all knew that middle class families are paying $800 more in income taxes under this government, but we learned that the wealthiest taxpayers, the 1%, are paying $4.5 billion dollars less, according to CRA data. Wouldn't it then just be predictable that they would hit working-class families with higher carbon taxes while giving an exemption to those well-lobbied for industrial polluters? Why is it that wealthy Liberal insiders always get the brakes? Honourable Minister of Finance. I know that the, I know that the member for Carleton wouldn't knowingly mislead this House. Perhaps what he's trying to just refer to, though, is the fact that we raise taxes on the top 1%. Maybe that's what he's referring to. Because if he actually looks carefully at what we've done, we lower taxes on middle-class Canadians. So they're in better shape. And if he takes into account the Canada Child Benefit, what you can see is that Canadian families, average middle-class families in 2019, will be $2,000 better off than they were in 2015. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. We would be happy to give him a briefing if you'd like to understand them better. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, I learned of a veteran who's been waiting for over a year for treatment of glaucoma. One of thousands of veterans waiting on claims just to be open, processed, and then to actually receive the benefits they deserve. The Conservatives failed to spend over a billion dollars in seven years allocated for veterans. And now we know that the Liberals have left yet another $375 million unspent in just three years. That's enough money to clear the growing backlog of veterans that are tired of waiting. How can the Liberals justify failing to spend this money on the veterans who need it the most? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Sure, and we will ensure that veterans receive all the benefits that they have earned. In fact, it is our top priority. As I said yesterday, our benefits are demand-driven. So whether it's 10 or whether it's 10,000, we'll always make sure that eligible veterans come forward and they will receive the, veter the benefits to which they are entitled. They are based on estimates, and this process guarantees that whether a veteran comes forward this year or next year or the year after, we'll always have the resources available for our veterans. I would only ask, Mr. Speaker, and I would encourage the NDP to look inward at their plan for veterans, or lack thereof. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of looking inward, People with disabilities have been waiting for far too long for a National Accessibility Act, and Canadians were disappointed when Liberals' legislation was tabled with no timeline, no requirements, and services as important as via rail could ask for an exemption from this Act. They, they could actually ask for an exemption. So for each of us, each member in this House, Knowing that we have to face people living with disabilities, people who face barriers every single day on a daily basis, we're with them. We're the Honourable Minister of Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud that tomorrow we are commencing debate and second reading of Bill C-81, the Accessibility Act. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that in my opinion, this is the most significant piece of disability rights 
this legislation since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mr. Speaker, I'm excited to be working with the member opposite on this bill. I'm excited that we can get it to committee tomorrow as soon as possible so we can make it as substantively great as we possibly can to include the full participation and inclusion of every Canadian in our society. For Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister has a serious ethics problem. Ooh. He is the first Prime Minister in the history of our country to be found guilty of breaking ethics laws. His Minister of Finance guilty of breaking ethics laws. Ooh. And now, during his summer of failure, his most trusted Cabinet Minister and his close childhood friend was also found guilty of breaking ethics laws. Oh, guilty. 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 Will the Prime Minister finally act and fire his close friend, or does he truly believe his friends and all Liberals are above the law? Yeah. Well, Minister of Federal Government of Northern Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, as the Ethics Commissioner said, in this case there was no preferential treatment given and there was no financial uh, benefit derived. Mr. Speaker, my colleague manufactures great indignation. Uh, he talks about people uh, who should, in fact, be found to have not followed the law. He doesn't mention a guy who was in this house called Dean Del Mastro, who, in fact, Mr. Speaker, left in a sheriff's van with handcuffs and leg irons on for not following the law. Where was the manufactured outrage at that point? Order. Order. I'd ask members on both sides to come to order. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Well, Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government is becoming notorious for its flagrant disregard of ethical practices, and in their summer of failure for its failure to abide by the Prime Minister's promises of accountable government. The PM and his ministers are shameless in the face of accumulating conflict of interest violations. Shameless now, caught in their breaking their own rules, allowing registered lobbyists to buy their way into exclusive Liberal fundraising events for access to government decision makers ordinary citizens don't have. Mr. Speaker, why do Liberals think the law is for everyone else? Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're proud to have brought forward Bill C-50, and we're proud to be taking concrete actions to disclose even more information than has ever been done before when it comes to fundraising. However, Mr. Speaker, what we don't know is who's attending Conservative fundraising events. For example, the $1,525 event that was held on July 28, 2016, or perhaps the $1,550 fundraiser that was held on June 21, 2017, or perhaps, Mr. Speaker, the $1,525 event that was held on April 21, 2016. Mr. Speaker, who is attending their events? What do they have to hide? Thank you. L'honorable député de Lévy. Alors, alors, order. Honorable député de Lévy, l'obonnière. Monsieur le Président, pendant cet été désastreux chez les libéraux, ce n'est pas le travail pour le bien et la prospérité économique de notre pays qui fait leur priorité, mais encore une fois, les cantons portés, les accès privés au club qui financent la poche du Parti libéral. Aucun remords de conscience après toutes ces années où les libéraux ont contrevenu aux règles éthiques en utilisant les ministres au profit des petits amis. Monsieur le Président, devant la longue liste d'accès privilégiés aux petits amis, quand les libéraux vont-ils être justes? le 28 juillet 2016, où ils avaient 1525 dollars pour être avec les conservateurs. Ou peut-être le 21 juin 2017, ça a coûté 1550 dollars. Monsieur le Président, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont à cacher? Pour que, pour, pourquoi est-ce qu'ils ne sont pas transparents? Merci, Monsieur le Président. 
Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kelly. Seniors in my riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South have told me they worry about their financial security. Whether they're retired or approaching retirement, they're concerned not only about their future finances, but about the day-to-day -day costs they face right now. We owe Canadian seniors for their contributions to building this great country. We need to provide a quality of life we can be proud of. Can the Minister for Seniors please tell this House more about our commitment to Canadian seniors and their quality of life? Thank great you. question. Minister for Seniors. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour and a privilege to rise for the first time in this House as Minister for Seniors. will continue to work hard for seniors. We have raised 100,000 seniors out of poverty by, um, by rolling back the age of entitlement for OAS and GIS from 67 to 65. We've increased the GIS for the most vulnerable single seniors. Those seniors are receiving up to $947 more a year. We've invested $40 billion into a national housing strategy. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. In parts of rural Ontario, municipalities have planned mail-in ballots for their upcoming elections October 22nd. Their chief administration officers have raised concerns over reports of a possible postal strike. Can the Prime Minister tell this House what measures he has put into place to ensure that the elections proceed as planned? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, member for a question. Our government respects and has faith in the collective bargaining process. Mediators from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service are working with both parties to assist them in reaching an agreement. We're closely monitoring this labour dispute, and we encourage both sides to get down and get an agreement on this issue. Le nombre de victimes de la maladie de Lyme augmente chaque année à cause des changements climatiques. Comme Simon Martin, un citoyen de mon comté, des centaines de personnes sont atteintes par cette maladie au Canada, entre autres des agents de la Fonde et des enfants. Alors pourquoi le gouvernement les abandonne-t-il en n'appliquant pas le cadre fédéral de la maladie de Lyme? Où sont les 4 millions de dollars promis pour la recherche de meilleurs tests diagnostiques et de traitements plus diversifiés? Pourquoi faire vivre un enfer de l'errance médicale aux victimes de la maladie de Lyme au lieu d'agir maintenant? Le gouvernement reconnaît que la maladie Lyme est un problème de santé croissant associé au changement climatique. En plus, des cas sont signalés chaque année. Nous aidons les Canadiens et les Canadiennes à protéger contre la maladie de Lyme en les sensibilisant à la prévention et nous appuyons la formation des professionnels en santé et en matière de dépistage de la maladie. Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Yesterday, our government moved one step closer towards the ratification process of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. This is a very significant and important step in our national trade diversification strategy. Can the Minister for International Trade and Diversification update this House on the ratification process of this important trade deal for Canadians? Well, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague from New Brunswick Southwest for her excellent committee work and for her question. We have made it clear that our government is committed to the implementation of the CPTPP. This trade agreement will open a market of 500 million consumers, which will result in growth and jobs for Canadians. We are working to diversify trade so the middle class can compete and win on the world stage. We look forward to working with all MPs to get this done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, pour la citadelle de Québec, les libéraux utilisent une pierre américaine non conforme de qualité inférieure, alors que la pierre d'origine est disponible l'autre côté du fleuve à Lévis. La pierre utilisée selon les experts ne rencontre pas les critères techniques, géologiques et patrimoniaux pour respecter l'intégrité de la citadelle. Que fait le premier ministre pour tolérer une situation inacceptable où des emplois sont en jeu et où l'intégrité et le statut de Québec comme ville du patrimoine mondial est menacée? 
Mr. Speaker, our government values the rich heritage of the Quebec uh, City Citadel. That is why we are taking steps to protect it. An open and transparent process awarded a Quebec bidder uh, of the contract to replace the damaged stone. This bidder is required to adhere to the federal guidelines to ensure that the Citadel retains its UNESCO status. National Defence is doing its due diligence to ensure that the winning stone adheres to the heritage qualifications because we understand the importance of this to Quebec City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, le gouvernement a cédé un contrat pour trois brises glaces au chantier Davis cet été. Ce qu'il nous cache, c'est que le contrat est tellement mec que depuis, la Davis a dû congédier 400 autres personnes. Belle tentative de se défiler, mais ce n'est pas vrai qu'on va laisser tomber nos travailleurs. Le Premier ministre a ordonné à son nouveau ministre de la garde côtière de renouveler la flotte en faisant l'acquisition de nouveaux navires. Est-ce qu'il va obéir en offrant dès cet automne un vrai contrat structurant à la Monsieur le Président, notre gouvernement obtient des résultats pour les Canadiens en fournissant à la garde côtière la navire dont elle a besoin pour servir la population canadienne. Cet été, nous avons donné à Davis un contrat de 6 millions de dollars qui donnera 200 bons emplois à ses employés pour assurer que nous donnons l'équipement and will assure that the Coast Guard has the ship ready. Honorable member for Bay Council, Nicolas Sorel. Mr. President, what we're asking for is just the beginning of the compensation for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the circumstances under the government of the federal government for a historic under the en plein emploi au chantier pour au moins une décennie. Les libéraux peuvent-ils s'élever au-dessus du niveau des conservateurs et offrir au Québec une part respectueuse des contrats? Voilà. Le service public. Nous sommes conscients de l'excellent travail fait par les, les travailleurs de Davis. Cet été, nous avons donné un contrat de 610 millions de dollars à le chantier Davis pour l'achat de trois brises glaces à la transformation du premier navire. Pour conséquent, jusqu'à 200 bons emplois vont être créés pour la classe moyenne. Merci. Monsieur le Président, il y a des politiciens qui pensent qu'il faut se taire sur Trans Mountain parce qu'on souhaite de la péréquation. Fait qu'ils ont fait un contrat unilingue anglais. Savez-vous combien ça va coûter aux Québécois, cette pipeline-là? On a déjà payé pas loin d'un milliard, puis on ne sait même pas où que ça va s'arrêter. Ça, c'est comme Muskrat Falls, un projet qui nuit à Hydro-Québec, qui est en train de mettre Terre-Neuve en faillite. C'est les Québécois qui vont payer ça. Monsieur le Président, quand est-ce qu'Ottawa va arrêter d'utiliser l'argent des Québécois pour nous appauvrir? Ouais. Ministre des Finances. Président, nous savons que l'approche que nous avons prise, c'est important pour notre économie. Et ça, c'est bon pour l'économie dans l'avenir, avec une façon d'avoir le marché international pour nos produits. Mais en même temps, le projet, projet lui-même est économique. C'est très important d'avoir l'opportunité pour notre économie, mais en même temps, nous, va, nous allons trouver une façon d'assurer que le projet Trans Mountain est économique pour notre pays. Bon jour. Government orders, government bills, common, resuming debate at second reading stage of bill C-79, comprehensive and progressive agreement, Trans-Pacific, partnership and implementation.